cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide Buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Hey everybody, I've noticed a new buzz surrounding GLP-1 agonists like Ozempic. I'm sure you've seen it too. Since some recent research results came out painting the drug as one tied to age reversal, my Reddit and Facebook feeds have been simply put popping off. Now, of course, I looked into the trial where these claims came from, so you don't have to. Let's talk about it and whether it's actually applicable to the general population and what the results mean. This is fresh off the press, and the article is released as a preprint, not yet officially published through a peer-reviewed process. We've discussed semaglutide at length, as well as terzepatide and retitrutide, how they work, what research up to this point suggests, so I'm not going to rehash every detail we've already covered, but it's worth honing in on the specifics of this new data given all the hype. The trial in question is called Semaglutide Slows Epigenetic Aging in People with HIV-Associated Lipohypertrophy, evidence from a randomized controlled trial which came out of University Hospital's Cleveland Medical Center in Ohio. What researchers did was analyze data collected from a 32-week double-blind placebo-controlled phase 2b trial in this patient population. The sample size was modest, consisting of 45 people in the semaglutide group and 39 who received placebo. And this data was analyzed via what's called a post hoc analysis, where researchers, after a trial has concluded, evaluate the data to explore a hypothesis that wasn't part of the original trial design. Post hoc means after the event. And although it's not unreasonable to look at data after the fact, doing so isn't always ideal because the study wasn't originally designed to test epigenetic aging, it should be interpreted with caution since retrospective analysis lends itself more strongly to chance affecting the results. And since HIV-associated lipohypertrophy refers to individuals living with chronic HIV who develop abnormal fat accumulation, particularly visceral fat, the original purpose of this trial was to evaluate how semaglutide affects body fat distribution. So patients were dose-optimized on semaglutide over 8 weeks, then continued on 1 mg per week for the remaining 24 weeks until the trial's conclusion. To evaluate bio biological aging, researchers used 17 DNA methylation-based clocks, these tools that analyze chemical tags on DNA to estimate how fast someone is aging and how well their biology is essentially holding up. These included traditional age predictors, mortality risk markers, pace of aging models, and clocks that assess aging in specific organ systems. So many of these clocks were upgraded using Principal Component Analysis, or PCA, which is intended to improve reliability in a clinical trial setting. So in simpler terms, blood samples were taken at week 0 and week 32, and researchers analyzed peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which you'll see as PBMCs, and using these sophisticated algorithms, they estimated whether a person's cells looked older or younger than expected, how fast they were aging, and whether these different organ systems or domains like the brain or the heart were aging faster than others. And although multiple of these models showed improved features of aging, the one gaining the most hype currently is a tool called PC Grim Age, a DNA methylation-based estimate of mortality risk, meaning it evaluates how aged your cells look in relation to risk of death. In this case, semaglutide was associated with a 3.08 year lower annual epigenetic age increase compared to placebo, hence the claims online that semaglutide was shown to reduce biological age by 3.1 years, which pretty much means that on average people on semaglutide aged about 3 years less biologically than those on placebo over 32 weeks. So it doesn't mean that these patients with HIV not on semaglutide aged three years over 32 weeks. It just means that when this data was extrapolated over a year, the difference was about 3.1 years, as interpreted by this mortality predictive epigenetic clock. So optimistically, this finding could support the idea that people's epigenetic age decreased with semaglutide treatment, thus shifting their biology to a point where risk of death may also be lower. Beyond PC grim age, semaglutide also showed promising effects on other aging clocks tied to mortality risk and system level aging, but it didn't seem to improve markers of physical or cognitive resilience at least as captured by a newly developed intrinsic capacity clock, which aims to measure overall functional health and biological robustness. 
Moreover, while semaglutide appeared to reduce cellular features of aging across a variety of organ-specific systems, it lacked statistical significance in the lung, hormone, immune, and musculoskeletal domains, so those results should be interpreted cautiously. As the researchers summarize, and I quote, Over the 32-week intervention period in individuals with HIV-associated lipohypertrophy, a population characterized by metabolic dysfunction and accelerated biological aging, semaglutide treatment led to robust attenuation and, in some cases, reversal of age-related DNA methylation signatures, which is quite optimistic and, in my opinion, quite promising as well. But I, like researchers, acknowledge the pro-inflammatory physiologic atmosphere created by chronic illness, fat accumulation, and insulin resistance, whose improvement could understandably facilitate positive physical and biological changes. However, I, like the researchers, don't think a small sample post analysis in a very specific subset of people dealing with HIV is at this point generalizable or applicable to the broader population. Point being, although the research is fascinating and promising, the clickbaity headlines about semaglutide reducing biological age by three years are more of an early signal than a proven fact for healthy individuals without HIV-associated lipohypertrophy. And the researchers themselves emphasize that semaglutide's effect on central adiposity likely played a key role by targeting fat-induced inflammatory signaling, which is particularly elevated in this population. And to the credit of the researchers, although it's something you should expect, they do highlight the limitations of this data, including the sample size, the post hoc design, the limited 32-week time frame, and this lack of generalizability. Point being, this isn't something to brush up, but it should be taken with a grain of salt. I do hope you enjoyed this video. My goal here wasn't to dismiss the findings. I saw the posts. I was going to read the article either way, and I figured at least some of you would want to be taken along for the ride. So if you did, please hit that like and subscribe button. It goes a long way for your small-time peptide buddy. And if you're looking for additional ways to support the channel, there is a Patreon available, a 20-page educational guide on BPC-157, and a growing peptide codex catalog that has descriptions about these different peptides, how they work, the extent of the research, perceived risks and benefits, as well as links to my videos on the topics. But most importantly, once again, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I hope you have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.